Welcome again. At this point, with the few of you that are here, I'm wondering if there's anything I can do to make you stop listening. I had known my guest today, or known of him for several years, but even with how close our circles are, I don't think I ever would have gotten an interview with him except, so I'll tell you a little story. I was running a DoorDash delivery to a mobile home park, and as God would have it, I saw someone I knew. And as I rolled by, I rolled my window down to say, hey, and they invited me to come and visit for a few minutes, like right there. They weren't joking. Um, I couldn't right then. So I went and finished my other deliveries and then it came back by. Thankfully, they were still there. They were actually having a visit with Jeremiah Roberts from the Cultish podcast. We talked for around an hour and I invited him to come onto the podcast, which he agreed. So we start off this show with Jeremiah's bio and background right away. So I won't get into that now. We also talk a good bit about cults, which is his strong suit. And then we also get into talking about our hurdles with starting our podcasts. So before we get started, uh, I do ask for a dollar a month donation. You can set that up at voluntarytheocracy.org. And if you have any questions or comments, you can send those to T-H-E-E-O-C-R-A-T at gmail.com. Theocrat at gmail.com. Theocrat with two E's. Deuteronomy 4, 5 through 8. See, I have taught you statutes and rules, as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do them in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples, who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him? And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? My name's Adam Terrell, and I'm here to encourage you to obey the law and think about it and speak about it constantly. I broke the law. Christ paid my debt by sacrificing himself so that I can be clean to offer myself as a living sacrifice back to God. The entire Mosaic law is obligatory for everyone. Keeping some of the laws look different today because the light of further revelation supersedes shadows in the old law. The temple sacrifices are an example where we have something better. Note that we must still obey the Mosaic laws for sacrifices. There is still a temple, and priests are still required to offer sacrifices. It's just that the priests, the sacrifices, and the temple are all better now. God will show grace to those who apply the law to themselves, to those who have hidden the law in their hearts, and he will judge those who disobey accordingly. I must apply it to myself, and then those around me will see its fruit and be drawn to its goodness. Theocracy grows by the sword of the Spirit, God's word, and self-sacrifice. The law's purpose is to give a path to restoration. Christ has restored me, so I must seek to restore others by sacrificing myself. Thanks for listening. My goal with each conversation is to edify and bring the law and wisdom to bear on each person's current situation in life. My name is Jeremiah Roberts. I uh, co-host and help produce a show called Cultish, which is about a Christian perspective on the world of cults, uh, specifically non-Christian cults. A um, little bit of my background, I uh, initially grew up in California, and uh, since, a young, since I was from a young age, I was always sheltered and homeschooled, I guess you want to call it, just kind of just doing my own thing. And eventually moved to Arizona and uh, homeschooled my way through to uh, from northern Arizona all the way down to uh, Mesa, Arizona, which is right outside of Phoenix. And my introduction to the world of non-Christian cults was um, there was a point where uh, my mother, she had just some health issues where she wasn't able to uh, homeschool us anymore. Uh, my parents didn't want, so my parents didn't want me to go to public school, so they found the perfect in between because they couldn't afford private school. Well, let's go ahead and uh, get me and my older sister into a charter school, and that school happened to be a school uh, called Heritage Academy, and I found out within a couple of weeks that the school was ninety eight percent Mormon. Um, all the faculty and staff were from Brigham Young University, otherwise known as BYU. Sorry, did you say where this was? Uh. The, it was in Mesa, Arizona. The, okay, the Arizona. School. Okay. Yes. So at that time, given the super cliff nose version, about 15, I think I was about 15 years old. And that was kind of the first time I had really uh, 
been in a bubble outside of my own group, in a sense, without my yes men. So it, it kind of set me off on a journey, kind of really wondering, what do they believe versus what do I really believe? Um, I ended up getting a book by someone named James White. Uh, some of you who listen to the podcast may have heard of. It was a book called Letters to a Mormon Elder. And that began, uh, I, I started just re- reading that book over and over and over again, trying to understand these letters. It was based off these fictional letters to uh, written to a Mormon missionary. And I read that book over and over again, started talking with my classmates about it. Uh, ended up actually getting in t- contact with James White because he was speaking on Mormonism at a uh, local Baptist church uh, close to the church that I was attending. And went up and introduced myself to him, all starry-eyed, and was like, oh, you're the one who wrote this book. I'm, I'm your biggest <laughs> fan. And it was just cool because I was 15 years old, and, I mean, he already kind of had a name for himself with everything that he was doing, even at that time. He's a super prolific debater. How many yeah. hundreds of debates has he done? Uh, many. Uh, probably more than anyone else currently alive that I know. I think when, when all is said and done, when it comes into the archives of the of what he's contributed to the entirety of the Christian church, it's going to be seen as an amazing contribution. So in the meantime, you know, the best you can do, you just have to keep on getting all the, taking them punches from all the different bloggers, the right. blogosphere out there. <laughs> right. But um, the thing I really appreciate about it is that I was just, you know, a wide eyed, nerdy 15 year old kid. And James White gave me the time of day, uh, not only to talk to me, but he invited me and my older sister uh, to come to his house because the Mormon Easter pageant, was upcoming where they do a giant, uh, very high quality production play of called Jesus the Christ, which is just the, at their depiction of the of the Gospel of John, and in that they use it as a proselytizing event. So he invited us to come to that, and of course we uh, readily accepted. And um, uh, my older sister and I we went uh, for the, probably three or four weeks, and we learned directly from James at his house about how to talk to Mormons. And I ended up going out there as a 15 year old kid. Uh, just still trying to someone who kind of grew up intellectually sort of understanding the stories of the Bible, the story of Jesus, but it was never anything that was personal. Now I'm trying to grasp how do I actually communicate what's going on? Like, so I would understand that most non cult, most cultic systems will have, it's all based on works. So you have to continually perform, continually do something or whether it's a small destructive cult like Jonestown or just a religious non-Christian cult like Mormonism, where there's always continuous works you have to do. And so I would read something like Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9, and I would only know it to the extent that it was different than what Mormons believe. This is what I believe, but I didn't really understand what grace was. I didn't really understand what faith meant. So I remember I would quote that verse when I was arguing or just say reasoning with uh, the the Mormon people out there at this Easter pageant. We went out there on the street to evangelize. And I just remember I had no recollection of what that actually meant at the time. So that continued, you know, I continued to study and to research and I ended up getting a copy of Kingdom of the Cults by Dr. Walter Martin, who headed up the Christian Research Institute uh, back in, I believe, the 60s and 70s. And he was also known as the first original Bible answer man. And yeah, I just started listening to a lot of his lectures and was really into that. And then just fast forward to four years later, um, I met someone, uh, some, you may know Jeff Durbin. I was at a Starbucks just reading a book called the case for Christ and, uh, in walked a young beardless Jeff Durbin and saw me and looked at me and said, are you Christian? You know, all, all, all wide eyed and, and all that. Um, and so I was like, yeah, who, who, who are you? So um, we ended up just uh, talking, exchanging numbers, and turns out he is really into witnessing the Mormons too. And I said, oh, I remember, I used to do that with James White. And so I started doing that with him. And and fast forward to 20 years later, uh, here we are. He is uh, now the pastor of Apologia Church. I also attend there. I am a deacon. And about two years ago, we had already, we, we had always done countercult ministries or apologetics in relation to uh, non-Christian cults, because uh, we would argue that ultimately the biblical worldview is the ultim- is the only real b- b- a belief system that you can really even justify or give an accounting to cults even existing or why they're even wrong in the first place. 
we're we're unapologetically Christian in our podcast, and you know, at least a couple times a month, we get a stunningly original review that says, "Oh, this is just another cult talking about cults." <laughs> and so, in, anyways, we would just do a lot of apologetic outreach and all that. And then Jeff approached me and said, "Hey, why, why don't you, you should probably head up a ministry to the cults and just head that up." I said, "Okay, well." What does that even look like? You know, trying to trying to really figure that out. And um, yeah, so it was just something that I was thinking through. And I said, well, what if we did a podcast that was just strictly focused on cults? Said, we can give it a shot. We might, I don't know if we'll, how many ideas we'll have. If we'll ever, we might run out of ideas sometime soon. And just for everybody listening, you're on episode, what, 330? We're in our, we're about two and a half years in. <laughs> and we've still have barely scratched the surface. I mean, we have a lot of episodes on Mormonism because that's obviously our bread and butter. Um, but we're trying to always approach things unique and different and explore a wide, broad variety of topics. But we're around, we're 100 plus episodes in. I mean, some of them are like a part one and part two, so that counts. But as far as individual series, it's quite a bit. It's quite a bit, but there's, there's no shortage. I feel like we've only scratched the surface. And yeah, hoping at some point we can actually be a full-time gig. So we've, Andrew, uh, my co-host, the Super Sleuth, we, we've built it part-time together. And uh, so, yeah. But anyways, uh, that podcast launched back in October 2018. Um, there were some a lot of challenges when it first started, a lot of growth, because whenever you're creating something that you're directly behind and you're directly responsible for, I mean, there's levels in which it's challenging, but it almost taps in and exposes your own weaknesses and insecurities. Like you have to really face that. Um, and so, for example, like I was always very shy behind a camera. Um, growing up, I always really struggled with hearing the sound of my own voice. So, you know, you'd have the, you know, family camcorder, you know, back then before you'd have the phones and everything like that. And so whenever you'd see the, we'd start playing the old family Christmas footage, I would hear my own voice and I would just like, I really sound like that, you know? And so, yeah, there's just a lot of shyness and insecurity you sort of have to work through. And even now, you know, people all the time, you know, message me and say, Oh, so blessed by the podcast. This is so awesome. And there's times like, okay, I guess it's, it's, it's all right. It's good. You know, you always try and like downplay it rather than receive the compliments. And there's, yeah, so it's been a very interesting ride so far, but yeah, that's a super, super cliff notes version. And so, yeah, we, we see there's a lot of opportunity and, and also it's been, I think a lot of, a lot of the success that cultish has had, is be, is not so much that, hey, look at us, look what we're doing, we're a bunch of superstars. I think it's just really indicative of the marketplace of ideas and the fact that there's not really a voice out there that's consistently dealing with a broad variety of these topics, but strictly from a biblical worldview. Uh, everything from, uh, like I said, fringe cults, historical cults, uh, UFOs, uh, the occult, um, conspiracies, uh, like true crime, all these different topics, topics we've explored, we've done, done it from a, a strictly Christian perspective. So I think that's just, just something that people have really latched onto, and I'm, I'm excited to see where the podcast goes. What are some of the responses from Mormons? I'm sure you've had a fair share of Mormon listeners or people that are in cults come across the podcast at some point. Yeah, to be honest, I haven't necessarily gotten a lot of review negative reviews from mormons regarding it there's i think there just there is something about are they not allowed to listen to it <laughs> <laughs> well either that they they tend to obviously if someone's actively in a cult they're not they're they're typically are told not to read literature or listen to things that are critical of the church and this could be whether it's mormonism scientology um you like you name it there's always this level of isolation either physically or mentally or emotionally or just trying to say, hey, don't do that. Or a lot of times they'll have a siege mentality where they will interpret any sort of criticism as unwarranted persecution. So there's that variable in play. But also I think there is a deterrent too, like the word cultish. You know, I think there's just something about that logo that you're almost attracting people who already are, who already are convinced that Mormonism is cultish. So I think there is a there's a hold up. <laughs> we're doing a podcast right outside here. This is that we're gonna do. This is your first in house. This podcast, is the right? first. This is the first uh, in person podcast. Yes, for sure. Which is always which is another thing too of a podcast that no matter where you are, you just have to start 
and work with what you have and push through it like no matter what. Um, but anyways, we were talking about what was the last thing? Um, reviews from Mormons are, Oh yeah. So I think there's your, some, your logo yeah, is something already just, kind of attracting. Those yeah. People. There's something about cultish that will either like though they want to listen in, or I think sometimes it's a deterrent. So if you're totally convinced that Scientology is the truth, and you see it featured on cultish, you're like, oh, I don't know. I don't know how I, I know feel what about perspective this. this is going to be coming from. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, a lot of times, like, you know, what's interesting is that we do get a lot of people who, some people who are atheist agnostic who listen in and, and appreciate the fact that you're, that they're getting, they know they're going to get a Christian perspective on something. Um, and there's other people who just get really mad because we are using as an avenue. We're strictly evangelistic. We don't believe we we don't live in a world of neutrality, so there's that variable in play. So yeah, um, I, I think that uh, you know, it's a broad, broad, broad variety, and there's obviously people who are upset because they, like I said, they're expecting me to be preached at, but then you have people who just are really encouraged by it, so it's a broad variety. Most of the stuff that you've done has been on Mormonism, and there was one episode that I listened to uh, where you talked about when a Mormon couple are married, the husband's given a secret name. I had never heard about that before. Yeah. Are there any, if you want to explain that and maybe touch on some other things that you use typically in like an evangelistic scenario, mm -hmm. insider information, so to speak, that you have. Well, yeah, there is an aspect of the LDS temple that when a couple is sealed uh, in the more, and again, the, the temple has gone through significant changes since its origination with what actually goes on inside. Um, and it is something you have to be careful of, especially when you're talking to a Mormon. It's usually best to strictly deal with their theology. Um, I don't, yeah. So, cause when, as soon as you bring up something like, Hey, I know it goes on the temple it immediately raises up this, this wall, right? Because they would say it's not secret, it's sacred. So they have this aspect where that's, that's off limits and you shouldn't talk about that. But in reality though, um, just as far as their theology is concerned, that exists outside of the uh, what goes on in the temple, but it's also part and partial to it. So within the Mormon temple, when a uh, man and husband, a um, man and wife, <laughs> a husband and wife are, uh, sorry, I'm a little tired today, <laughs> but um, when they are sealed in the temple, uh, the husband is given a secret name, and that name is given to call up his wife on the last day. Um, and that is, that's an avenue. This is it's just an aspect of what they believe and what part of what the whole aspect of being sealed for all time and attorney in the Mormon temple is. And that carries over into why just the rest of your life. Cause as the Mormon woman, you just know that I have to stay within this marriage or obedient to this person or other people just don't think much about it. But it's like, well, this is my person who has to call me up on the last day. So I've had a couple opportunities and I don't do it all the time. It just, it just depends on what the situation, if the situation allows for it, but specifically if there's a Mormon girl or uh, sister missionaries, that's a great verse to bring up is John six forty four, which says, uh, and you typically that's a Calvinist first, Whichever it's a Calvinist proof text, but uh, no one comes to me unless the father. No one is able to come unto me unless the father draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. So, but the point in bringing up John six forty four is that according to Scripture and according to what the Bible says, that the only person who has any authority whatsoever to raise someone up on the last day is Jesus Christ. So I've actually brought that up and have shown them that, um, and also I can't remember the reference off the top of my head, but in Matthew when Christ says that uh, neither. Like neither are they given away or, or married in heaven. Basically saying there's no marriages in heaven. It's, it's here on this earth. That's a representative of what of our relationship long-term with Christ is. So, but both of those, when you bring them up in the right way, it's one of those times where you kind of see that, that like paradigm shift, mm. you know, which is one of those things that it's, it's almost not, not necessarily like it's a, I'm doing it for the thrill, but it's there's, to help them have an epiphany that they need yes, to have. There is there is this level of excitement though that comes along with just when you have those opportunities. Like Walter Martin said, he would say that he always wanted to have a cultist read when he he would give them a he wouldn't just quote the Bible to them, but whenever he had an opportunity, he would actually give the cult he'd allow the cultist to actually read it himself to him in context and then explain it to him. And in not a way, not of them, all of them are like right away. Like, oh my gosh, I get that I was wrong. But all of a sudden, you they kind just of sort of see, get silent, and they just need to pull away and sort of 
yeah plug that into like, their what thinking what's going for the next here? three well years. i noticed that you're you're you got the you probably are a little bit of a gamer here and you probably know like the whole history of video games but you think about like the the classic game metal girl, metal girl solid which i never play but it's all about tactical espionage but in it if you peek around the corner but someone sees you or has a has a feeling that something's going on you'll see an exclamation point kind of go above their head mm. and almost in the same the sense you can see occultists sometimes where there's a Mormon or Jehovah's Witnesses when when you're talking to them, you'll see that explanation point go a little bit above their head, <laughs> which is always always makes for a fun uh, conversation as well. Right, I've I've had those moments given to me, and I've given other people those moments many times, and I think it's important to note that you don't, you know, when you have an epiphany, it's like you need to. When I have them, I need to sort of pull away and like reprocess and recompute. And there have been certain things that I've gone through that it took me like three, four years to wrap my head around. And then how does this connect to all my other ideas or what other of these other ideas is this going to undo? Um, and so it's important when you give that sort of a moment to somebody to not continue beating them over the head with it. Yeah. Like they got it and it's going to take them a while, like yeah. leave them alone for a little bit and come back later and see what, what fruit that bears. Right. Exactly. And that's one of the aspects too of, uh, one one of the passages I love is with uh, the Apostle Paul in Acts 17, when he's talking on Mars Hill, and he kind of gives this whole proclamation, the sermon to the unknown God. And there's several different reactions right, people have. People, some people mock and jeer. Uh, other people say, "We'll hear you again on this matter. Let me think about that and get back to you." Then some believe. Right. Right. You'll get usually it's eighty twenty. Typically, you'll have eighty percent mock and jeer. It's like not even pay attention to you. And then you'll then you have twenty who who come up in conversation with you, and it's usually that you know it'll be it, it it'll be like well here you again let me th let me think about that, and obviously our goal is you know we we can't convert anyone but we want to plant as Walter Martin would say that we pl hopefully plant some seeds of doubt and allow the Holy Spirit to do its work, and hopefully by God's grace the uh, third category would come up. Well, and, and even within that 20%, there's those that appear to believe, but then they fall away after a time, you know, with Jesus yeah. with the parable of the seeds. And then I, I remember Paul, I can't remember exactly where it was, but he talked about, you know, continually having um, persecution from brothers. Mm -hmm. And so it's people that claim the name and they look and, and you teach them for years and then eventually they fall away and you find out that they were never really, they never really believed it. Right. They went out from us because they're never of us basically. Right. Which is just another uh, total side aspect. I mean, I'm 40 years old as we're recording this, and um, you know, I, I, I'm just kind of looking back at the last 20 years, like being in college when I first started really being challenged in my faith, and um, just seeing how many people there who, yeah, for a while, like spoke very adequately about being in Christ or was adamant were adamant Christians and. So many people now identify themselves as deconstructing or, or identify themselves as ex evangelicals um, for many different reasons. I think part of the aspect of that, and it's almost part and parcel to the relation of the cults being the unpaid bills of the church, that the cults almost came out from us. Hmm. That one, Christians are not being equipped. Uh, look, the, 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 they're not being given the totality of the gospel. They're just being told that Christ is there to give you love, joy, peace, and give you those fruits of the spirit. But it doesn't, there isn't a lot being taught about being taught to suffer well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like I've, I've had my own difficulties and hardships and, and, you know, different things. Like, what do you do? Like, what do you do? Most of the churches don't really have a huge way to equip you when you're dealing with like real bouts of depression or when you have a lot of people that you are close to abandon you for like no reason. Like, what do you do when it's big leagues, uh, difficulties, trials and tribulations? And that's an aspect of the parable of, of the sower of this, of the peril of the sower. Like some seeds fall on hard ground, but other times, you know, other seeds plant. And sometimes it has to do when people hit those trials and tribulations, they just fold. Um, but also I think there's an, within the Christian church, there's a lot of, there's just not a lot of real good, deep theological training. I think I can't tell you how many times I've talked with someone who's a legitimate Christian. They love Jesus. And I ask them, can you name me, name me, give me five verses that emphatically show that Jesus Christ is, is God in him come in the flesh. And 
hardly ever. And there's a really get, small section you can yeah. turn to and find one pretty quick. Just yes. read a couple chapters and you'll hit one. Yeah, most people do. And they still can't find it. Yeah. And that's a huge, huge problem because that's the one commonality that every single destructive and non-Christian cult has or any, any sort of non-Christian system has is that they want Jesus on their team. They have to do something with him, but they have to deny his lordship. They have to deny his deity. Um, he can be a, he can sort of be this like vegan, uh, animal loving ascended master, or he could be whatever you want to label him as, but he can't, he can't be God. And that, and that's one of the, that's one of the important aspects too in regards to that. Yeah. That's one of the things that my dad encountered with uh, Jehovah's witnesses where they, they say, well, Jesus is not God. Jesus is the son of God. And they will quote certain new Testament verses as proof texts, proof texts, uh, or I think there was one, I can't remember it off the top of my head. Every time I think of it, I have to ask my dad what it was, but there's a verse in the new Testament where Jesus says that's talking about him. And then you go and you read that in the old Testament and it says God mm. or, the, or the Lord and Jehovah's witnesses have never had somebody go that in depth with them and they don't really know how to respond. And then the meetings stop. You right. Know? Well, yeah. I mean, like you, for example, uh, just, just a two, like I call it a, a jab hook. To teach someone is Isaiah forty two eight. Uh, you hear uh, God says he no one will I will not share my glory with another. And then in John seventeen five you have Christ who is praying to the Father and he's talking about the sh- the glory that he's sharing with him mm-hmm. before the foundation of the world. How is Christ if he's not God or lesser than God? How is he sharing the glory with the Father when when God says he won't share he it. won't share it. So who, who, what's being shared? I mean, you have, have to, it's, it's a two way, it's a two way street. You can't share something with yourself. <laughs> so yeah, that's just, that'd be like one example that people could just, if they just focus in a little bit and just learn some of the basics, uh, I think that would be a big way to also not only counter the cults, but also be able to give an answer, but also reach out to them. Uh, Walter Martin had this great illustration where he was talking with someone who was a, um, he was the head of some major bank and within the bank, he, uh, there was a, a special training class for how to detect counterfeit money. And so Walter Martin asked this guy, he said, I was curious, like how did, do, what do you do just like study a bunch of false currency or, and trying to figure out or study the counterfeit he goes, Nope. For about three to four weeks, all the new people who come in, the only thing they do is that the, they just handle brand new, freshly printed money coming out of the printers or whatever they, or the mint or whatever they mint the coins. And all they do is just handle the original for three weeks. And so the moment after that, a counterfeit bill goes through their hands. You don't even have to look at it. Like just the very feel of how the ink is pushed together, the crevices. And usually there's a little, little like a seal in the middle, like with all that, um, like you just know uh, that it's that's false, and so Walter Martin gave this great illustration when it comes to the world of cults is that you don't have to become an expert on and all the wrong things. Yeah, and all the wrong things. You don't have to know all the aspects of Jim Jones's crazy theology or or David Koresh or uh, Mormonism or Scientology or Jehovah's Witnesses or Christian Science. You just need to become familiarized with who Jesus Christ is, and you won't be fooled by anyone. But the people who don't know are the ones who are susceptible to being sucked into the cult, but also ones who won't be able to give a real answer for their faith or be able to counter what the cults are saying about who Christ is. And that's a really important thing I think is missed in the church. There's not really much of a discussion. It's a monologue and people see that as sort of the pinnacle. Um, It's funny. It's like, I just had this thought, the, you know, there's a piano sonata, which is just a piano all by itself. But then there's a piano concerto where the piano is like the most important thing. And it's focused on the piano, but you've got an orchestra around it. And mm-hmm. in the music world, concertos are thought of as the ultimate form mm-hmm. of music, not a piano all by itself. And that's what I feel like Sunday teaching on Sunday should be. And hopefully teaching during the week. Um, I had that with my dad where he would teach us for a couple hours every day Bible and we would ask questions and discuss things. And that's where the learning happens because you can talk about something. And then after you're done talking for an hour, it doesn't really resonate with anybody. It's like, Mm -hmm. oh, well, you could have remedied that by just asking a couple of questions. You know, okay, who's my audience? Who's listening? Where are they at theologically? How can I help them get to the next step rather than say, 
I really like this subject and I'm going to talk about it for a really long time and then nobody cares. Mm -hmm. It's like, and you don't even have to be a brainiac. You know, you can be still, uh, know something on a very rudimentary level that nobody's ever experienced before. And all of a sudden now you're an expert in it, even though it's a really basic, boring topic for you. Right. No, no, definitely. I think, um, yeah, I just again to, to reemphasize. I think that is just something that's really missed. And hopefully, you no, know, what we we can do is that with the podcast we put together, I mean, most of the time it's just been someone leaving or getting out of a cult. But it's always scripture based, and it also has really encouraged people to kind of get back into the word and having a foundation for which to explore. Um, and that's again one of the problems too is that for someone who's atheist or agnostic, when they just label something a cult. Like, what does it ultimately, how do you account for the fact of what is wrong with me, uh, for my, with my brain fizzing or Jim Jones's brain fizzing and getting a bunch of other people who are just bags of biological protoplasm to get their brains to fizz in a certain way? What's basically, as Jeff would say, what's wrong with Stardust bumping into Stardust? Like, what is, are you, are you assuming that it's wrong, cults are wrong because they manipulate? So in other words, they're, what are they manipulating? There's a standard in which you're supposed to treat people. Well, how do you account for that? In it looks ultimately in a just boils down world. to well, I'm I'm God, and so I'm I get to decide the rules, and I don't like that, so it's wrong. Right. That's all they have to go on, and then all you have to do to challenge that is just say, well, I disagree. Well, so now there are two standards, right. and my standards right just as right as yours, isn't it? Yeah. Why Why are your ought? Where's your ought coming from? Why is that binding upon me? Right. Um, do you feel that believers are just not getting enough discussion about this? Um, and, and then that's why you started the podcast. Um, it was multifaceted. I think that, um, I saw there was a huge need, uh, just with it, just to have something internally within Apologia focused in on that because it, it's something that we had done. And, and when, as we were getting into end abortion now and the other ministries that we were doing, um, it just, we just, I just knew that there needed to be something that was laser focused. And I think that's why Jeff had reached out to me, but yeah, so one of the needs too was not just uh, to be able to give an apologetic answer, but I saw the world kind of really tackling the world of cults. So shows like Leah Remney's Scientology, The Aftermath, or other documentaries like there's one called Holy Hell, which is kind of a really weird documentary with this weirdo who is based in uh, both California, Texas, and Hawaii, and this is someone who just manipulated and sexually abused people and just used and abused them for years. And you saw these people who escaped and just emotionally destroyed and devastated. And a lot of them just didn't have any point of reference for their suffering. And so a lot of times, or these other shows like, all right, well, great. You're out. Now you can think for yourself. Well, you know, GK Chesterton says that the only an open mind an open mouth is no different than an open mind. Eventually it has to bite down on something. Like, how do I know I won't be deceived again? Like, what's my point of reference? What standard mm -hmm. can I grasp? When there's no shortage of wrong answers out there. Right. So just because, you know, it's like Thomas Edison had to do what a, a thousand or 2000 different iterations. Right. A, a wrong answer is worth very little because mm -hmm. there's so many ways to get it wrong. So coming out of a wrong cult really doesn't leave you that much better off than somebody who has never been through anything. Right. No, and I think that's one of the. It's just a variable in play where, you know, Walter Martin would say that you know, like again, the existence of a counterfeit predicates the authenticity of an original, and that's why I think when people you look at spiritual manipulation, the spiritual abuse, and the sociological and psychological ma manipulation that really hurts and affects a lot of people, and even just the mental health epidemic among people who are ex cult members. So it's not just evangelizing reaching the cults, but it's also evangelizing reaching ex-cult members because the majority of them become an atheist or agnostic. And one, it's always a challenge too because you want to have empathy with them with what they went through, but you can't allow them to stay there. I think you have to really show them that, well, the very the, the point that you're so hurt by the way you were treated pre predicates there's an authentic way. Mm -hmm. There's an authentic way to be loved. The fact that you're unloved or the fact that you were sociologically manipulated, right? Um, and people did it with an ulterior motive just to get you to submit or to be loyal. Well, thankfully, the Bible gives us a standard where 
we can have we can have a, we can actually give an accounting for why that's wrong. For example, why when it talks about First Peter to love one another fervently from the heart, where it comes strictly out of a changed heart, and you love someone, or as a Christian, you could say we like we love because Christ lo- first loved us, and so our motive is not to try and manipulate someone or get or to love bomb them to have them to psychologically throw them off balance. We have a we have a basis for loving them, and so when it comes down to it, I th- that's yeah. I, I think that um, when it comes to ex cult members, there's a lot of hurt, there's a lot of pain, and you need you need to reach them in that pain, but show them the true hope of the gospel that there is there there is hope and healing and a real way to make sense of their suffering, what they went through, because you're not going to ultimately get that in an atheist setting or an agnostic setting or just an indifferent setting because otherwise you'll see a lot of ex-cult members who don't know Christ. There's just a lot of bitterness still, like a resentment, and it's almost their identity is then as I am the ex-Jehovah's Witness, I am the ex-Mormon, I am this, which is honestly a lot of those ex-cult podcasts that are non-Christian, they're hard to listen to. For me, they're almost depressing, which is... Sometimes you look into the stuff, you get into it, and then you have to take a break as well. So yeah, that's uh, that. That's what I got to say about that. So you're in the process right now of moving to Utah, and that's a sort of a cult mecca. Yes, yes. Well, uh, who knows when the? It's funny you say that because yeah, it, it's a it's a broad, crazy variety. There's a giant Hari Christian temple, one of the largest ones in North America, that's up there, and. Um, and yeah, so it's uh, it, it's just, it, it used to be really around 70 to 75% Mormon. That's changed a lot where you have a huge percentage of the population now that's secular that really doesn't want to have anything to do with religion or just kind of very indifferent because a lot of them are just ex-Mormons. That's encouraging. And yeah. <laughs> and then, but you have a lot of people too who are just becoming a lot more postmodern. And so it's just an interesting bag being up there. So well, what's happening right now is that apology... Uh, a church is planting a church in Salt Lake City, Utah called Apologia, Utah. And well, Andrew, who is my co-host, we call him the super sleuth. He's actually part of that church plant. So he's actually the one of the, the planting head deacon and, uh, Wade, shout out to brother Wade. Uh, he is going to be the head pastor. So there are, there's a lot of questions for what the future of cultish looks like with, a co-host who's in another state uh, for the time being, I'm still in Arizona. Um, I'm kind of seeking praying through if it's God's will for me to move there. I'm just kind of uncertain right now, but we're trying to figure that out. But we do know that it's incredibly needed. There's a lot of churches out there who are just kind of really isolated. Either one, they're just not involved in the culture because they're afraid to or Mormon churches or Christian churches. Well, there are Christian churches, but they're spread out. Um, it's just a really, it's, it's a lot of, it's just a small amount, but there's just a huge, large percentage of people who are either Mormon, ex-Mormon, atheist, agnostic, or people who leave, but they don't really know where to go to. All their connections are still Mormons. Yeah. So there's not really, it's like, okay, well, what's the safe haven where I can actually rebuild my life? So it's a very difficult infrastructure. There's going to be a lot of challenges. So as far as what the role is of cultish, that's just something we're having to figure out and what I am praying through because cultures is still something that Andrew and I, we built part time uh, between everything else that we were doing. And now we have this large audience where it feels like a full-time gig, but it's still part time. But if it given what the future of what the potential of the Salt Lake city has to become, then um, it does make sense that cultish would end up there. So you think you might do like Mormon guest interviews and yeah. start talking to members of the public, like, on on the podcast, we're yeah, we're definitely interested in that. I just think we we've we've kind of had it's just funny. We, we just said we're going to do the podcast and, not, and just kind of figure out what that looks like. And so we had a really big episode uh, for, on Bethel Church when we first launched, and that really exploded. What is Bethel Church? Be- Bethel Church. It's a church out in Redding, California, that would kind of be under the realm of like hyper charismania. Some people put it with an evangelicalism. Other people call it a cult, but. It, there's a lot. It, it's it's always been with its fair share of controversy. So there was a girl who was part of uh, uh, their schooling program, I guess you'd call it, uh, called Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry, and she ended up watching a, a film called American Gospel, and she was really affected by it. 
And she started speaking out publicly against Bethel because she had watched this documentary and she's someone who's actively at church. She's actively uh, attending Bethel in Redding, California. So she ended up getting kicked out. And I, I just happened to get a hold of her right at that time because people had messaged us to talk about it. And, um, and so, yeah, I just messaged her and then she ended up getting uh, on the show and really, I didn't realize how big of a thing it was because she left in very controversial fashion. And from a number standpoint, the previous week, we got around 2,000 downloads. Uh, the following week when we dropped the series on Bethel, it was around 38,000 for the first episode. So you wow. talk about just a numbers increase in anything. You know, if you if you buy a Bitcoin, it goes from, you know, $2 to two, 280 a coin, you would say that's a to-the-moon investment, mm-hmm. right? And so that's just something that happened there. And so it's kind of become interviewing ex-cult members who found Christ, which is awesome, but I want to expand that beyond just like talking to Christians because otherwise just kind of, I always, I don't want to just do the same thing over and over again. Cause that's something when, if you're a creative person, you're going to plateau. If you just do the same thing over and over again, you always have to think outside the box, be brave and try something new and uh, risky. And that's where the reward comes in. Yeah. Well, and you never know when you're going to hit those pay dirt type moments yeah. and you just have to keep on going. Whereas, well, and especially for bringing a whole bunch of new people in, now they can go and look to your past uh, library of stuff and find other things that they're interested yeah. in as well. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And there's just one thing too. I mean, how long have you been in the podcast for? Uh, about beginning of 2019. Okay. Yeah. And so whatever, whenever you're doing a podcast, whenever you're, whenever you're first starting off, like the biggest thing I would tell someone too, is that one, and you probably can relate, you, you, you just need to start. So many times you're going to stink at the beginning. Yes. So many times people just spend time getting ready to get ready. Um, but the thing is you just got to start with no matter what, and you're going to make mistakes. You're going to have, you're going to be like, Oh my gosh, I can't believe that. Um, well, like when we first launched, we we're supposed to draw, drop four episodes all at once. The day of our launch, it just so happens. We found out that, uh, it's like, Oh, we forgot to actually upload our, load our RSS feed, open up an iTunes account. So everyone's expecting these episodes to drop on iTunes it's like, oh, shoot. And <laughs> well, iTunes takes like four or five days sometimes. Yeah. Thankfully, it didn't take that long, but we still, we got it up on a website the same day. It just, it was just one of those things like a launch day. It was like, oh my goodness, like we may not actually launch in the day we're going to launch, but we just pushed through it. And then a couple of weeks into the podcast, uh, Jeff, who was kind of co-hosting uh, it with me at the time, uh, had a seizure unexpectedly and i had to take the realm i had to sort of grab it by the horns and andrew who's sort of being the background researcher he ended up uh, joining me as my co-host and jeff came on for a couple more episodes but after that andrew and i just kind of took this thing head on uh we grabbed the bull by the horns and we just uh you know it has challenges i think 2020 was unique for a lot of people i mean for some people it, it broke some people um, and other times you, like you had a choice to, are you going to, it, it affected everyone. Like everyone collectively experiences worldwide. And for me, I just had this moment, like right around the end of March where I just was like, well, I don't care. No, I don't care no matter what, whether I go out with, whether COVID is this black plague and it takes me out, I'm going to just find a way to do an episode no matter what every single week. I just told myself, if I can get through 2020, just dropping a podcast every single week, no matter what, like, I'm, I think I'm going to, that's going to, I think make I'm going to have anything. A, yeah. I'll have the wherewithal to make it through anything. <laughs> and so, yeah, that was something that was, uh, once you get, well, yeah, once you got through that. And then also there are multiple times where I just, you, I didn't feel like doing it. Like, oh, okay. It's just one week. And I was like, nope, you just got to do it. And I think that's just one of the things too, is that when you're, in podcasting that so many times you'll have, you'll, you'll put up every reason, every excuse in the book not to do something. But I think, and also so many times people will have, they'll start getting some traction, get a little success, but also go, Oh, well now I need to go to this. I now I need to start working on a, I need to start a YouTube channel or I need to do this or I need to start a Twitter. I need to start an Instagram. Well, you need to start one thing, get good at that, do that consistently and then, and then hopefully you'll draw in yeah. other people that'll say, then can I on. run your YouTube channel for you? Yeah. And then jump on that. So, you know, like after the last two and a half years, we have an audience that uh, built this now around 22,000 followers. 
and you know a Facebook audience around the same time. But that is the all organic, no paid ads, nothing like that. But it's something that is just you know I work for uh, the Don't Creative Agency, and his big thing is always posting on social media, doing multiple posts a day. And when you do that, it's just there's something about consistency that that just builds compound interest. And so, yeah, that's uh, that's just a couple of thoughts, too, in regards to podcasting. I'm sure you can relate. Yeah. Well, there was times, too, I, I originally started out trying to do once a week, and that was too much. And then I eventually went to once a month. And then I didn't really get any response from it. I think I had maybe 20 or 20 or 30 regular listeners, but they were all people that I knew. And then eventually, uh, I think I quit for like... Uh, Gosh, I think it was like eight months. Mm -hmm. I had several podcasts in the bag, but I just didn't post them for whatever reason. I was just like, ah, I think I'm done. I'm not really getting much of a response after like a year and a half, or maybe it was about a year of doing it. Um, and then all of a sudden I got like several emails like, Hey, what's going on? Like, where's the next one? Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, several people actually started donating Bitcoin. They started ah. finding me, finding my email and being, or finding me on Facebook and they're saying like, Hey, do you have a Bitcoin? account like can i send you something i'm like oh really i need to do a coldish bitcoin account see people, <laughs> people can pay me in ethereum <laughs> i just launched uh my uh website yesterday and somebody said hey you said on your podcast that uh you can go there to to do like a recurring donation or bitcoin and i go on the website and there's only the recurring donation where's the bitcoin and i'm like oh hi uh, who are you <laughs> how'd you mm. you know how'd you find me um but yeah it's it's funny like i've I've never asked for donations or anything. And people were like contacting me saying like, hi, Hey, hi, can I send you money? Yeah. So that's, that was really encouraging. And then I was like, okay, well, I guess I have to start doing this again. <laughs> and now we're up yeah. to like, uh, probably 200 around 200 monthly listeners. Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah. I, and I think, um, it's one of those things now too, we're finally, you know, because of the fact that we've been working so con so just grinding out for like two and a half years. And so many times people think they need to have overnight success. Why well, I just opened up a YouTube channel yesterday and I only got 15 views. Well, okay, but you're, you're just, you're three weeks into the game. It takes YouTube a long time to figure out what you are. So they know who to algorithm deliver your right. stuff to. Yeah. So it just, it's something that just takes time and you just have to kind of work through all that. But in that, but now thankfully, because we've been able to grind through for two years and now we're kind of in this revamp overhaul. We're exploring kind of going into a subscription based model. Um, I don't know if it'll be necessarily be like Patreon, but just a way to actually monetize it. Cause we've been strictly donation based, but it's just sometimes with consumer people like to consume and not necessarily contribute. So we're, you know, we're kind of looking at that, but thankfully now we can actually kind of pull back just a little bit. when we release episodes, I feel like now we kind of have the high ground where all these people were messaging us, messaging us like, what happened? Like, why isn't there an episode this week? Or you had to wait two weeks, you know, and that's the whole thing. They call that negative testing. Mm. You take something away and you see, oh, who does this actually matter to? Right. Yeah. So, yeah. And, uh, yeah so I think there's always opportunity you know, to do it. I think just with, when you're creating anything, it just, you have to constantly work away and grind at something. And it's only afterwards that, you know, I'm looking at, where we are as a podcast and ranking consistently in the, in the top part of iTunes and all that. And I think it's just, um, like I said, it's indicative of the marketplace of ideas of given the content that we cover, but also it's a byproduct of many late nights. Um, you know, we're working, putting together episodes, you know, having conversations, fun conversations, trying to schedule people yeah. that back out at the last minute, ones that are even difficult and challenging issues, uh, with certain guests and all that. Um, and so, yeah, there's, there's all, there's all these challenges that there's a verse in the book of Proverbs where it talks about where there's no oxen, the trough is clean. And mm -hmm. what it's saying is that back in the old Testament times, in fact, I'm actually uh, at Darren's place and he's got horses that I'm feeding and making sure they're taken care of. But along with oxen during the old Testament times, that was something that was very, it was, that was really prime real estate. You almost based your wealth. I mean, oxen was kind of like the Bitcoin of, of, of old, of old Testament times. It was just, uh, yeah, it was just the oxen, but along with that, it just comes all the poop and the pee and everything else. You constantly have to clean out those troughs. So it requires that. I mean, and in many ways that this podcast, your podcast, like it's, it's this little ox that you're building and you're raising and you have to, you have to do a lot of cleaning and you have to do some raking out of all this 
garbage that's, a, that's a, just a byproduct of the grind. But along with that comes a lot of great conversations, the ability to bless a ton of people. And we get messages all the time. And also, I think too, uh, I'm just kind of giving a lot of different thoughts, but I think also, especially being a Christian, uh, and then I've kind of experienced a little bit on a very micro, micro level of uh, being someone that people recognize or being a little bit in the public eye, people who will recognize my voice or every now and then I'm at church and someone will you know say hi to me. But there's times where even with social media and everything like that, it's kind of being a, a little bit of a public figure kind of gets to you. Like you kind of think you're more than you are, you know, and you sometimes you lose track of the big picture. And so that way lately, the verse that's really been on my mind and on my heart has been John three thirty, which says he must increase, but I must decrease. And that's just been something that I want to take any aspect of like, Ooh, look at me. I'm the, I'm the coldest guy. Like I want to just curb stomp that and put that to death. Not that I only, I just want to use it in a way that can be a catalyst for good because there's such a need out there. I don't want to ever get my, let my own ego get in the way. Yeah. It's, you never want to get so big that you forget how you got there. It's like a tree saying, Oh, Hey, I'm really high up here. I can forget the roots. That's basic stuff. Right. <laughs> well, you take away the roots of the tree and everything that's up high is going to come down. Well, yeah. Even like with a uh, Conor McGregor, you know, you think about him and, and he's been one of the most notorious and successful uh, MMA fighters in history. But it seemed to me, he had this like real hunger when he was up climbing up through the ranks when he didn't have a whole lot, but it's like, but all of a sudden he got it all and he had all the Lamborghinis, all the fancy Gucci, everything. And that playboy lifestyle. And all of a sudden there was a while where it seemed like he just kind of lost motivation or kind of lost that drive. So sometimes you, you achieve, you have a notable amount of success and then, you know, it gets to your head and all of a sudden you kind of lose track of why you even started in the first place. That's why they call it the circle of life. If you're up high, <laughs> you need to focus down low. And if yeah. you're down low, if you want to be high, then make yourself low so that you can mm. have somewhere to go. That's good. I like that. So it's like, there's never a place to stop. Mm -hmm. You know, God, he's the greatest person. And so he's like, well, if I want to be greater, I better make myself low. Yeah, no, definitely. Definitely. So what do you see yourself doing with the podcast? Um, what is left to go? What kind of ideas are you kicking around? Uh, there's so many, a lot of them just sort of happen to be what falls into our lap and what seems like a good conversation. So what specifically is going to be debuting the rest of this year? I don't know. It's just thankfully because we, again, this is something too, where it's almost that aspect and feel the dreams. If you build it, that people will come where now people message us all the time. We barely even have to reach out or now we've had enough of a following to where if someone wants to, you know, someone in like high of high notoriety, like we reached out, we had connections now where we were able to get it. Like we had John Cooper from skillet. Uh, we had him on and other people. I just contacted Alyssa Childers who's got a pretty large following and she listens to us and kind of knew who we were. So she's really excited to be on the podcast. Um, so yeah, I think, there's, it's just a matter of just trying to look through and kind of figure out who's messaging, what seems like a right conversation, but also, you know, well, we do have a lot of episodes on Mormonism, for example, but we're always kind of looking at, if we're going to talk about Mormonism, what's an approach we can take that's fresh and unique versus anything else that we've explored? Like, what's something we can do in that regard? Um, and so... But yeah, there's so much we we want to do. We, we would like to focus on some different historical origin stories. Uh, we still haven't dealt into Seventh Day Adventism, um, and we haven't done. I'd like to do something on Waco at some point. Uh, a lot more of the historical cults, and yeah, I mean, there's there's so much. There's so much you want to do. It's that's. But I think now there's. Uh, you know, initially when I thought I didn't really think they'd be like, oh man, they're just, I don't know if we're going to have enough topics, but I, as I think someone, I heard someone once say like, don't go to the ocean with a spoon. <laughs> and as crazy as there's always, and this, this is another thing too, is that there's always blessings in disguise. There's always silver linings and everything. And I think one of the big silver linings for COVID is that, for example, it forced a lot of people, if they wanted to stay in business, they had to really think outside the box of what they had to do to keep their doors open. Um, and exposed a lot of other people exposed real holes in their game that probably put them under and hopefully they could learn from that. So businesses, for example, that were bringing as much in as they were uh, putting out 
or putting or they're spending as much as they're bringing in. They they have a little small plateau, and all of a sudden there's the lockdowns, and you lose two weeks of revenue, and you're done. That buries you. Well, you kind of have to look at the fight tape, you know, and, and look at that. Um. So yeah. What are some of the cults that you've encountered that, or, or maybe done a show on that people aren't as familiar with or haven't heard of, that um, you find particularly interesting? Yeah, we just did one. Uh, it drops on Monday and Tuesday, which is very interesting. It was something that's very brand new. It was a cult called Love Has Won, and they're based out in Colorado. They're kind of an internet-based cult of this girl who thought she was mother, this lady who thought she was Mother God, but she was really erratic with a lot of strange behavior and she had a lot of real mental health issues and she ended up dying the seed of the whole thing yeah. right there now it becomes and explodes when somebody yeah. dies right and she was on dr phil and but then she ended up dying and i guess they kept her alive but then they wrapped her in christmas lights and it was just such a really weird fringe thing so uh there's that um I'm trying to think so far we haven't done like a whole lot of fringe stuff that people don't know about but I think it's something if it's the right story, it'd be something that's interesting. Probably the cult that a lot of people didn't know about, which at that time, just because it had kind of fallen off the radar, uh, talking about the Church of Wells, which is this really strange cult based in Wells, Texas, that we interviewed uh, Matt Meyer, who is their next door neighbor, and kind of be able to give his firsthand account of what it's like living next door to them. So, yeah, that was uh, that. That'd be one example of one. And I think also. Probably the most unique interview I remember just having is, I mean, I had a lot of them, but I think specifically being able to talk with, when I was sitting across from Warren Jeff's 65th wife, uh, former 65th wife, and being able to hear her story of someone who grew up from a very young age being groomed to be married to this man. And that was really or her upbringing and how she actually got out and escaped that. It was just, it was just like, I can't believe I'm actually talking to this person. You know, you hear this person in the news. And now you're looking at someone like I'm on the outside looking in like this was your life. So yeah, those that, yeah. So there's, it's, it's just, it's been a broad variety of topics. And like I said, there's just, there's no shortage of content. Yeah. You look at, you can look at all these people. Like I, I remember seeing, um, what was it like Prince Harry and his wife, going through all this stuff. They did the interview with Oprah. Yes. And it's like, well, why don't you just leave? And I'm like, no, you uh, can't. That, the, the best takeaway of that interview was the memes. Of course. Uh, I haven't seen too the many. The memes of are those. great. Just look at, look at the memes <laughs> later on. Okay. I will do that. Um, yeah. I, th I think really the biggest takeaway is just being able and like willing to discuss issues that are off the table and that people don't tend to discuss. And I think the church, that's why so many people are just deconstructing to atheist, to atheism or agnosticism. It's because they've got these questions and uh, I've listened to several different atheist talk shows and podcasts. And there just seems like there's a common thread between all of these is that their path pastors just basically start brushing them off when they start asking questions. Yeah. And it's just like, that's, that's cult behavior right there. And there's yeah. Christians doing it. Yeah, and that's one of the things, too, I, I really admire about Dr. Walter Martin. Anyone's listening in, um, look up this series called Walter Martin Under Fire, and that's where he would answer apologetic questions directly, and um, it was... Is it a, uh, an audio? It's, it's, it's on YouTube, yeah. It's just okay. an audio of him engaging. So he would always, whenever he'd le lecture on any... He was a professor of, com of comparative religions with all the credentials, and so he would, whenever he would lecture on a topic... Uh, or a different cult or religion, he'd always give the opportunity for anyone who's part of that faith or cult or religion to come up and ask, ask questions or to challenge them on it. That's really important. Make sure that you're not straw manning anybody and then they'll actually yeah. listen to you when you listen to them. It's funny yes. how that works. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Just because something is false or wrong or if someone's like a false teacher does not give you uh, precedence to bear false witness about them. Like that's just one of the things that there's a really interesting story too. Walter Martin one time was doing this uh, presentation on Mormonism with Ed Decker, uh, who was a former Mormon. They had done some stuff together and there's a point where um, Ed Decker makes this kind of audacious claim in regards to something to do with, I think it had to do with just some document or something that Joseph Smith said or did. And Walter Martin stopped and he's, and he's like on stage with him. He goes, where did it say that? And, uh, and Edward said, uh, well, uh, I'll have to think about that and get back to you. He's like, well, you better, you better, because it has nothing to do with fact. 
Like he called him out right there on stage <laughs> that this is false. This is not true. Like that's how committed he was to the truth. And I, I think that it's just something that makes Christ, like true biblical Christianity different than what you see cults as. It's not isolating from the outside world, but it's actually going out and engaging within the arena of ideas. Um, because so many times I think, you know, growing up and my parents, you know, try to do what was right. They kind of grew up in the, in the Jesus movement, the hippie movement and became, you know, saved hippies. And they wanted to kind of isolate their kids to protect them from the world. Cause they probably, you know, experienced stuff while they're in the world prior to becoming Christians. And so I think they had the best intentions in mind at the same time though. I think the, my best learning experiences when I was dealing with someone who believed something completely different than I did. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's there's definitely there's definitely that variable in play for sure. So where can people go to find the podcast website, get in touch with you? Are, and are you writing a book? Uh no, no no books. I just I put together great conversations. I see my felt myself as a, an offensive coordinator at best. And um yeah, I just I like putting this together and I like to be able to bless people. So no no book deal <laughs> or anything like that. Um but if you go to the cultist show.com, that is our website. Or if you look up cultish on Facebook, I think the Instagram tag is the cultish show because someone already took cultish. So yeah, that's where you can, uh, this, you can either find the website, check out our podcast or we're on Spotify, iTunes, your favorite podcast catcher. And, uh, or you can just follow us on the, on the socials there as well too. Thank you very much. Absolutely, man. It was a pleasure being on. Thank you for coming. Absolutely.